Hi, I'm uh, Charles Paxton from the University of St Andrews and I'm a statistical ecologist who's interested in reports of uh, sea monsters. And what I want to talk about today, well, I don't really want to talk about it so much as, as request information and collaboration from colleagues. And I want to try and understand what a good explanation for an anomalous aquatic experience actually is. What rules can we use as scholars to try and understand what people have reported? And when people report lots of things, they could report the Flying Dutchman or a ghostly boat or a ghost on board a ship. They could, of course, report sea monsters uh, like this one here or like, uh, oh, you can't actually see it behind my face. Um, this sea serpent that was reported off the coast of Ireland in uh, 1817. So people report anonymous experiences at sea. And sometimes the people who report such experiences are very, very important indeed. Um, in 1879 to 1882, the uh, two grandsons of Queen Victoria, Prince Albert Victor and Prince George of York, uh, as naval apprentices, went on a worldwide cruise on board HMS Bacanti. Albert Victor would later die, but uh, Prince George would become George V of England. And um, in 1881, the crew of the Bacanti, well, 13 members of the crew of the Bacanti, it's slightly unclear if the princes themselves saw this, um, but a red glow, as you can see here, a strange red light of a phantom ship all aglow in the midst of which uh, of which light the mast spars and sails of a brig 200 yards distance stood out in strong relief as she came off the port bow. And ostensibly 13 people altogether saw this vessel in, uh, and a strange light was seen by two other vessels, the Tourmaline and the Cleopatra. So we're left with, in this case, maybe a second-hand report of something anomalous that was seen at sea. And the question for me as a scientist is what actually happened? That's what I'm interested in, is what actually happened. Now, we've got eyewitness testimony, so we have to interpret that eyewitness testimony in some way. And there are a number of filters perhaps we have to pass through before we can actually conclude something genuinely strange actually happened. First filter is, of course, are the witnesses lying? Now, um, if there's multiple witnesses and they haven't colluded, then it would seem a reasonable conclusion that the witnesses, at least some of the witnesses, are not lying. So in the case of the witnesses of the Flying Dutchman, then perhaps we can assume that lying isn't actually the case. Of course, the witnesses might be telling the truth, but they could have been hoaxed. And certainly hoaxes do happen. Uh, in the 1830s, there are a number of reports of sea serpents um, seen off the coast of uh, Southern Ireland. And um, many of those reports turned out to be um, being placed by hoaxers. Uh, many of the witnesses could never be found. Um, some of the locations seemed a bit dubious. And so somebody was having fun at the expense of reporters. So hoaxing is something that has to be considered, but let's assume that everybody's acting in good faith, which seems the most parsimonious uh, explanation. So we'll assume, unless we have evidence otherwise, that people haven't been hoaxed. People may be telling the truth, but what they've reported is not in any sense objectively real. Maybe they've um, sort of hallucinated, or they could be fantasists in some sort of sense. Um, but in fact, there's no objective reality of the anomalous event that they've actually seen. Um, they could have had a genuinely strange experience for them, but actually it was something that was not actually strange. So in 1878, the um, Reverend Clean um, saw 
uh, and his party saw a sea serpent off the coast of Scotland, um, which was reported in considerable detail, there were multiple witnesses. The general consensus amongst biologists who've kind of considered this sighting is that it was probably um, a wake effect or it was caused by um, multiple harbour porpoises move, moving in a line. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it was a genuine sea serpent, but um, a prosaic explanation can actually, actually be made for what was seen. And maybe some witnesses have a low threshold for defining what they think is unusual and they're perhaps unwilling to consider prosaic explanations for what they've actually seen. Or maybe they're in some sense prime, they have some pre-existing expectation. I don't think this is the case in the McLean sea serpent, but witnesses, for example, going to Loch Ness might have an expectation of seeing a monster. So if they see something which in other places they might just dismiss as a wake or a water bird, but at Loch Ness it might be interpreted as a monster. Sometimes people have genuinely strange experiences caused by something unusual, known but not actually strange. In 1829, off in the Indian Ocean to the south of India, a um, strange flattened sea monster was seen that was uh, described as flat and dark in colour and covered in white dots. And it seems genuinely clear that this sea monster was fairly accurately described and it turns out that what was actually seen, we generally think, was a whale shark. Now the thing was, the whale shark had only uh, been described a few months before, um, and so the world did not know about whale sharks when this sea monster was seen in the Indian Ocean. Maybe a few years later it would have been recognised as a whale shark, but at that point it was sort of known, well known to a few number of people who'd read the paper, um, who read the descriptive paper, but of course the rest of the world didn't know about whale sharks. And so the witnesses had a genuinely strange experience, seen caused by something very unusual, but it wasn't really strange. Um, ultimately, ultimately, it wasn't ultimately strange, I think is, is, is one way of putting it. And of course, sometimes, people have genuinely strange experiences caused by something strange happening. Here we have an image of the Mary Celeste and um, the Marie Celeste. And we all know, of course, it was found abandoned in the open ocean. Now, whatever happened to the, the Mary Celeste, and there have been Mary, many um, explanations for what actually happened, happened to her, um, something strange clearly happened. Something was unusual in the normal turn of events. Maybe the crew abandoned her, uh, maybe something else happened. Um, we don't know, but whatever happened was quite strange, strange and unusual. Um, so for me as a scientist, one interesting question I'd really like to ask is then, and my real interest is in sea serpent accounts, as if the witness has not been hoaxed, lying, uh, or a fantasist, or sorry, if the witnesses are not being hoaxed, lying, or a fantasist, what have they actually seen? Now, so this is the problem I want to consider. And on top of that, there's another issue as well, that the process of me as a scientist seeing the reports has already undergone considerable distortion because we've got a sighting that was made and then from that sighting there's a memory made and then that memory's been transmitted and maybe recorded by somebody else and then that recording in some sense maybe written maybe oral um, has been made accessible to me and then it's been interpreted by me and at every stage in that process biases can occur. So it's really tricky to try and interpret what people have seen from eyewitness accounts of, of something anomalous. I want to illustrate that in detail by considering uh, one account that I'm very familiar with, um, which is uh, took place in 1875 of the Bart Pauline, um, which was aiming for Zanzibar, but it was taking a route across the Atlantic to probably to make use of the trade winds and it was actually off the well a bit off the coast of Brazil and the the um, for the captain the first officer and two three other three other members of the crew 
um, swore that they'd seen something very strange take place. And what they'd seen take place was they saw three sperm whales, but one of them appeared to be gripped uh, by a huge, serpent, huge sea serpent. And its back was a darkish brown, its belly white with an immense head and mouth that was always open. The head and tail, um, you know, had great length um, and with a great girth. And so by all accounts, it was a very, very unusual sight. And we don't know of any gigantic serpentine creatures that can um, wrap themselves around sperm whales. This would be on a scale bigger than anything um, that we know of. It would be very unusual because sperm whales are deep divers that have collapsible lungs. So um, having some sort of um, constricting snake feed on them would be, um, it'd be a very odd lifestyle for a deep sea animal to, 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 uh, to, to have. Um, and so the general view among zoologists is that there's some sort of alternative interpretation from what was seen. And we've got various witness statements. I mean, so we've got some drawings. So here is the actual drawings made by George Drever. Um, I should say that George Drever was an extraordinary person, had an extraordinary life. Uh, I've written two papers about his life. This was the captain. Um, he became obsessed with sea serpents and he became so obsessed with sea serpents that eventually, um, for a whole re re series of complicated reasons, he ended up on trial at the Old Bailey uh, threatening Her Majesty's Commissioner of Wreck, Charles Callaghan Rathery, um, with, with murder. Um, well, with the threat of killing him. So um, a very unusual life. I haven't got time to go into that now, but I've written two papers on that. So have a look those up. They're well worth reading. He, he was the most extraordinary character, um, a would-be murderer, but he never committed murder. Um, uh, a hero in many ways, um, a fervent Christian, um, he lost his life trying to save somebody else's life. He was a staunch advocate and inventor of um, uh, life-saving gear. And to prove his life-saving gear, he once tried to cross the channel in, uh, in, in using a hand-powered paddle boat, uh, like a, uh, and um, in each time uh, nearly died. Um, so an extraordinary character, one of these sort of extraordinary Victorian characters that gets thrown up. Uh, well worth knowing about his life. But anyway, what we're interested in here is the sighting from 1875 off, um, just off the coast of Brazil, where they saw a sea serpent, or what they interpreted as a sea serpent. Multiple witnesses, doesn't they swore on oath that they'd seen it. There doesn't appear to be any doubt about this matter. So they saw something. And so the question is, what did they see? And no consensus has been reached amongst the few people who've taken interest in this particular account. Here are some explanations though. It was a sperm whale. Now sperm whales, um, well, th there were sperm whales. They were recognized by Drever as being sperm whales. Um, he drew them kind of as sperm whales. Um, now sperm whales feed amongst other things on giant squid. And so it was suggested that what we're actually seeing is a sperm whale which had come, come to the surface and it had part of the squid was wrapped around its body. And what we're seeing are the tentacles of the squid kind of wrapped around in part the body of the sperm whale, which in fact is the aggressor here because it's trying to eat the, the giant squid and the giant squid presumably is just trying to defend itself. Another suggestion, um, especially as the sperm whales just described as frantic with excitement is that we're actually seeing sperm whales mating. And what we could be seeing is just that the, perhaps a, their fins are slightly kind of entwined with each other. Um, they're kind of rotating in the in the water, and maybe this is kind of misinterpreted. Um, my colleague Adrian Shine actually thinks that the species have been misinterpreted, and what we're actually seeing are humpback males waiting, uh, mating, and then the giant the the sea serpent is in fact their enormous um, flippers kind of wrapped around each other because that's that's what they do. Um, another interpretation by a Canadian ecologist, Robert France, is that it's a sperm whale entangled with uh, fishing gear. And a more exotic um, suggestion was made by a naturalist called Robert Wood in the 19th century that what they actually saw was an extinct uh, whale called Bacillosaurus, which is quite elongated in form or thought to be quite elongated in form. And that's what was actually seen um, by, the, uh, by the crew.
uh, there's a review of these different hypotheses in my paper um, so do have a look at that uh, driven mad by the sea serpent the strange life of George Drever so we're left with these explanations and so for me as a zoologist I'm kind of interested in the given something was seen is trying to work out what is the best explanation for what's seen and you kind of run into difficulties here because what you think is the best explanation perhaps is a little subjective so here's a table where I've considered five of the hypotheses well five hypotheses for what was actually seen so we've got um, uh, yeah, the five different uh, suggestions for what was seen, including an actual sea serpent. And I've taken four of the features of what was reported and then seen how each of those hypotheses for what was seen agrees or disagrees with the um, description. So it's described as serpentine and certainly a sperm whale eating squid could look a bit serpent, serpentine. Sperm whales mating, yeah, not really necessarily. Humpback whales mating, yes, if their flippers are misinterpreted as a um, serpent. Um, sperm whale fishing gear, yes, uh, because the fishing gear, that could be some rope and that could have got round the, the sperm whale and it could have been sort of, yeah, entrapped with a rope and so that could look, look like some sort of serpent. And of course, an actual sea serpent would look like an actual sea serpent. Countershading. Now, countershading, um, that refers to the characteristic, which you may recall from the description, where it, the serpent was said to be dark on top and light underneath. Now, this is a common feature of marine animals. It's a sort of camouflage. Um, that is an interesting feature, because often you might think of it as being associated with a, li a living thing. And so um, if the sperm whale is eating uh, a giant squid, certainly the tentacles of the giant squid are darker colored on the dorsal surface compared to the underside or at least the, the inner side so that's a possibility sperm whales mating no that probably wouldn't fit the bill humpback whales mating no probably not uh, sperm whale in fishing gear well you wouldn't expect the fishing gear to be countershaded so that so sounds a bit like a no again an actual sea serpent well you might expect that to be countershaded well they're described as frantic with excitement well would the sperm whale just eating squid make all three sperm whales frantic with excitement? We're not quite sure what that means. Um, sperm whales mating, though, they might be frantic with excitement, so that could be a yes. Humpback whales mating, well, they might be frantic with excitement, so that could be a yes. Sperm whales in, in fishing gear, well, if they're trying to escape from their fishing gear, they might be lashing with their tails and be quite excited in a, in a I'm not happy kind of way, so that could be a yes. And... Um, if they if the sperm whale was being genuinely attacked by an actual sea serpent then um, that presumably would make them frantic with excitement as well Drever was very struck on the fact that the serpent had an open mouth and that's really quite intriguing because that doesn't work for a, a, a sperm whale eating squid there's no reason to think that the tentacle of a squid could be interpreted as no as, as open mouth it doesn't make any sense in the context of sperm whales mating it doesn't make any sense in the context of humpback whales mating and it doesn't make um but it do, could make it could make um sense in the context of some bit of fishing gear that looked as if it was a gaping mouth and again an actual sea serpent my head is obscuring the conclusion i made there that of course could have an open mouth for some for some reason so what's the best explanation well the explanation with the most agreement in my previous slide was the sea serpent that was yes for every single one of the um of drivers interpretations of what was seen but it's not the most parsimonious explanation now scientists we generally use Occam's razor and we assume that if you've got hypotheses of equal explanatory power you choose the simplest well here we haven't got hypotheses of equal explanatory power um, uh, and we've also got hypotheses of different levels of complexity an unknown species is kind of more complicated than the known species um, now we have statistical ways of offsetting explanatory power versus simplicity of hypothesis but they don't work for single explanations so for single explanations well, we can't really use statistics so there's there's a there's an issue here but trying to work out what is the best explanation for what was seen is it the one with the most agreement well that would naturally lend you towards a sea serpent but 
that's not a very prosaic explanation. The one with the most agreement and prosaic, well, perhaps from my previous table, it's the sperm whale and fishing entanglement issue. So maybe a net or a bit of rope or something got tangled up with a sperm whale. But the trouble with that explanation, in a sense, it's too good because you can use it for any explanation of a sea serpent ever seen. You can just say, ah, oh, well, it was a whale with this sort of stuff entrapped around it. Um, it. It explains everything. And as an explanation that kind of explains everything, is really no kind of explanation at all because it can just be fine tuned for any sort of situation. So it's a great explanation, but is it the right one? Or is it one of the other explanations? But neither of those other explanations don't fit quite as well as the top two there. So I'm at a bit of a loss. I don't know what the best explanation for the Drever Sea Serpent sighting actually was. And I don't know what an appropriate rules are for considering single explanations. So considering multiple explanations at the same time, I'd use statistics. But I can't use statistics here because we've just got a single case. So this is my plea for help. My plea for help is can the humanities help here? Because I would have thought this, what is the explanation for a singular phenomena is something that people in the humanities consider. So help me gothic studiers of um, aquatic anomalies um, how how do i work out what the best explanation for a strange sea, sea serpent sighting is and maybe the principles established there could be used for other things like royal princes seeing the, the flying dutchman or people reporting ghosts on, on a ship or something like that so that's my contribution to this year's uh, haunted shores uh, conference um i hope you liked it if you've got any questions you can contact me at uh, cgp2 at st andrews uh, .ac .uk, um, and i'd be very pleased to hear your hypotheses um, and considerations of how we explain um, what are apparently genuine anomalous experiences thank you very much <laughs>